Planning and Zoning Board Commission, the first item on the agenda is a Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Next item is the approval of the minutes from uh, March 27th. Any changes? If not, I need a motion to approve. Move to adopt as presented. Got a motion? Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed like sign. Passes unanimously. Okay. First item is the Imagine Schools request for a special exception use approval for a charter school facility on 4th Street. And I guess, Stephen, are you going to handle this one? Come ahead. Yes, I can bring it on. Do the dance. <laughs> Good evening, Chairman Hamner. Uh, my name is Stephen Dirtoff, Long Range Planning. Uh, this evening we have the Imagine Charter School, which is a, as you said, a special exception in the RS3 zoning district. Uh, charter schools by law are a type of public school. They can be approved in the same manner as a public school or they can go through the county site plan and building permit process. Um, like most charter schools, uh, Imagine School has decided to use this process as the North County Charter and the Charter High School. Uh, staff posted the required signs on the site giving notice of this evening's public meeting. We contacted the surrounding property owners by letter. A notice was published in the press journal. And staff received more than 20 calls from neighbors with questions about this project. Four of the major concerns from the neighborhood were uh, campus security. At the time we told them the entire school grounds are fenced. One of the options was number of students. Phase one is up to 500 students, and that would be kindergarten through fifth grade. Phase two would be 250 students, no more than that. Uh, sixth, seventh, and eighth, or middle school age. Building locations, there is no building allowed within 100 feet of the residential zoning, and none of the buildings on this site are that close. Uh, another major concern was traffic. We uh, went over Fourth Street improvements with the uh, neighbors, and the queuing of traffic into the school is approximately 800 feet. The location of this site is on the north side of 4th Street between 58th Avenue and 66th Avenue. Uh, the area here provides us with a, a good idea. This used to be the former Port Bay Estates. As you can see, the, um, it's the location of the school. You can see the stormwater track and what used to be their road entry. Uh, the proposed site plan is in two phases. Um, the first phase is the kindergarten through fifth grade, and that has been approved, and their charter is approved for that phase. Um, it will consist of classroom buildings built here at this locations, the parking lot that will handle the bus drop-off and visitor parking. Steve, Steve, excuse me, could you back away from the mic a little bit because we, we can't understand what you're saying. It. I'm sorry. Thank you. And then in the south is the south staff parking lot and a drop-off and pick-up area for parents who are dropping their children off. They, they avoid contact with the buses. Also in phase one, it required as an outdoor recreation area of approximately 2.25 acres. And then there's the stormwater track that was approved for Parrot Bay and it will be used for this site. Proposed the landscape plan calls for 25-foot buffer, type B buffers, on all four perimeters of the site. And that is with a uh, six-foot opaque feature. And they're going to have a um, six-foot chain link fence in that buffer. It will be the dark, dark green <coughs> fence. And on the south side of the site will be a wrought iron fence, decorative and it will also be six feet. Um, there's a six foot fence. And then on the no, I'm sorry, northwest corner will be a pedestrian gate that will go to 61st Avenue and the Pine Tree subdivision. Any children living in that area could have direct access to the school. Phase one also requires 4th Street improvements. These are 
wide, uh, widening 4th Street, continue to widen 4th Street all the way to the west end of this site and provide a right turn lane into the school project. Prior to CO of phase one, all landscape improvements, that's the 25 foot buffer, parking and open space landscaping and the security fencing, the recreation area, the stormwater track, and the fourth street improvements, that's the right turn lane, and the paving of fourth street must be completed. Uh, proposed site plan for phase two would be the addition of four more classroom buildings and some additional parking that is proposed to be sodded, stabilized parking. This phase, they're going through the, the site plan process, but they are not chartered for the middle school at this time. Uh, staff recommends that the Planning and Zoning Commission recommend that the Board of County Commissioners grant special exception use for the proposed imagined charter school with the following conditions. All outdoor lighting shall meet State Route 60 corridor requirements. The applicant must construct a right turn lane on 4th Street, construct 4th Street roadway improvements, and install the required landscaping and opaque features. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Mr. Chairman, I apologize. This is a quasi-judicial item. We should Did I miss it again? Yes. Oh. Okay, sorry. Um, before we start the public hearing, and, and we're, first we're going to have questions of the staff from the commissioners, quasi-judicial means it's a sworn legal um, testimony, so anyone who would like to speak, please stand so you can be sworn in prior to speaking at this time. Uh, we can swear you in later if we have to, if you get the urge, but it's nicer to get it all done at one time if we can. Raise your right hand, please. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Sorry, George. That's why he gets the big That's bucks. That's he gets the big bucks <laughs> and the chair on the end. Okay, questions from commissioners for staff? The only question I had was the phasing. What is the time frame for phase one to come online? They would like to get it done as soon as possible uh, in the next couple of weeks. Oh, that quick. Like okay. to go to the county commissioners. You want, you want, no, I'll go in just a second. On, with phasing, um, I know I understand why they would want to do phase one and phase two with us, but does that? How does that affect the charter itself? I don't understand the chartering process. Are we are we helping them or hurting them by not doing phase one or two at this time, or phase two at this time? Just Stan Bowling, planning director. The the, the charter would need to be amended or, or modified to allow the sixth, seventh, and eighth, but uh, which is, it which doesn't affect this site. This site plan, this proposed. In other words, this is the, the kind of the maximum build-out plan. So, kind of worst-case scenario from an impact standpoint. And uh, if they never did phase two, they wouldn't have to do it. I mean, this is not going to uh, approval of this plan does not make them do phase two, okay. uh, but but it would allow for it if that can happen in the future. I see. Okay. Any other questions? I, I have one. Chair. Uh, we're providing for a right turn lane in. What about a left turn from the, from the opposite direction? A center turn lane going in? Uh, the traffic study showed that there was not significant traffic coming from the west on 4th Street. At this time or in the future? Or? Perhaps in the future. At, at build out, there would not be significant traffic to impact that? Is that what you're saying? With the total phase one and two? The traffic impact study was done with total build out. Okay. So it's intuitively you wouldn't think there would be. The urban service area is at 66th Avenue, so there's not going to be generators to the west. This, this so is in the urban service area. It, this is. This is. But if you look west, there is there isn't too much land within the urban okay, service area. Much left in the little pocket right, that goes right, out. Okay. Right. So, so you wouldn't think that there'd be a significant amount of traffic such that it would generate the need for a left turn lane going eastbound. I, Jerry, I asked this of staff earlier this week. There was one other issue which they seem comfortable with, and that is that it's even with low traffic, I've seen where cars are going into the point where the person turning into the school from the other direction, it may be two cars, can't get in. You know, someone yeah, either has sure. to let them in or they have to have a way to get in. Now, I, traffic says that it's okay, so, but, I, I, you know, I had the same question earlier. Leave it to the experts. 
Mm, I don't want to do that. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's a well, bad answer. We'll hear from Craig in a minute, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, anybody else? I just have one question on, on the stabilized parking. And we do this with churches. We allow them to have stabilized parking instead of paved parking because it's, it's a once-a-week issue with the parking. Um, and, and we like to have pervious surface because we like the drainage. But this is the first time I think I've seen um, stabilized parking for a school. Is this a new trend, or is it that the stormwater retention pond will not, will not support the impervious surface that would be created by that additional parking, or what's the reasoning for that? Right. I think the paved parking will be required for all of the required spaces that are associated with, with what is constructed. Um, I think I think initially there's going to be a stabilized area for for parking that may be uh, may be paved or upgraded later on. But these the the parking requirements that that staff is quoting in the item and that the, the site plan handles is for permanent paved spaces that are associated with daily with, with daily use and handicap, et cetera. Oh, certainly. So in the first phase, we've got 114 provided. 113 is required. Does that mean that in the first phase they're all paved with the exception of one? The, yes, they're all paved. All 114 will be paved. That's correct. When phase two comes in, will all of the 60, the next 60, are you saying that they're going to be required or up to uh, 173 will be required? Right. What, what we're saying is this. The, in, in staff quotes the two and a half spaces per classroom, one additional space for staff position. There will be paved spaces for the, what that number that's required. And they can, and they can, whenever, the and this is true of other classrooms times two and a half, which is what that, the LDR that, requires. That, that's correct. And there can be more spaces than that provided, and, and those that exceed our minimum requirement can be stabilized. And that's, and so that, then they become like overflow spaces, which don't have to be paved. Okay, so that's excess over what's even required for phase one and two total. Right. The, okay. Right. So I understand what Correct. you're saying now. With regard to the buffer, did you talk to the applicant at all about an A, a buffer? Can they handle an A buffer along the, where the residential area is? I think we, we, went, over, we went over buffering you know, several times in, in technical review committee. The, uh, we did not, staff did not recommend a, a type A buffer. Uh, uh, along the edges, there's a minimum for a type A buffer, a minimum of a 30 foot uh, width. I, I didn't, I mean, there, I'm going to ask the applicant that. I just wondered if you'd already asked. The, the reason for it is with St. Edward's School, they had the same uh, abutted a neighborhood, and we had a very thin planting. There were some complaints when they beefed up the planting, and all the complaints disappeared. It was a, a thicker buffer, and it got, you know, everything kind of disappeared. So I just didn't know. We'd already yeah. talked about it. If just his, historically, just to let you know that the, the type, the 25 foot type B buffer is a is a more substantial buffer than the buffer requirements that were in place in, at in the that, time. At that right. time, you're talking okay. about. Thank you. Anybody else? Questions of staff? Would the applicant care to be heard? And you must be Mr. Barquette. Yes, sir. Thank you. <laughs> New guy. Glad you remembered. New guy. <laughs> um, thank you for allowing us to be heard. I really don't have much to add. Steve's... W would you introduce yourself and name and address, please? I thought you did that. I'm sorry. It's Bruce Barquette. I practice at 756 Peachland Boulevard, and um, I'm representing the applicant. Um, but Steve's um, actually written report was extremely thorough, uh, which we appreciate his um, thoroughness. We have the project engineer, Bruce Moya, the traffic engineer, Brian Good. We have a, a land use planner, Ryan Rusnak, here with us. We have um, various and sundry other people that are ready to answer questions, but I really don't have anything to contribute at this time. With respect to the buffer, Mr. Hammer, as, as Stan said, the required buffer is only a type C, and I don't know what St. Ed's had there, but a type B buffer is pretty substantial. It does have a four-foot opaque feature, and and that's what we're providing. So we're already exceeding the requirements for that. I think it's a six-foot feature, isn't it? And including, is, are you going to do a berm with a fence and a hedge on top? It's a, it's a. Is it in twenty-five? In the twenty-five it's, with it's a six. Twenty-five feet. feet, yes, sir. Maybe, maybe it's six feet. I might have misread it, but um, it's pretty substantial already, and and um, I would not want to have to do a type A. It, it requires more square footage and a lot more money, and it just doesn't seem to be warranted at this point. And certainly. It, landscaping can be added later if there are complaints, but I don't, I don't really foresee it at this okay. point. Um, so again, I'm going to sit down. If you have any questions, we'll, we'll try to send the appropriate person up to the microphone to answer it. Any questions of any of the applicants? Are you, 
you reserving us comments for the end? Yes, please. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Public hearing is now open. We'll start over here on my right and work to the left if we could. I'm, some people stood up over here who are sworn if you'd care to speak. On the right-hand side, yes, sir. Oh, yeah, the two of them. My name is Jeff Brewster. I live at 360 Farley's Court, which is directly across the street from the entrance to the proposed school. I uh, had a, just a couple issues, um, certainly from what they were talking about, the, um, the the traffic from the west side. I think the 4th Street all the way along there is very narrow and unsafe, certainly for bicycles or people walking along there. If the school is going to go in, I think they should have to uh, do road improvements further to the west as well. Um, I, I, I jog out there that, in the mornings. I think that and, there are some, when they pave that, aren't they, what, what are they, they have to increase the width of the road, didn't they? They're, they're only going from the drawing that he put up, they're only going to their west boundary of their property. They're not going down 4th Street at all. Right. The, the, <clears throat> the proposal, which is reviewed by Public Works, is they're going to have the, the lane widths widened and, and shoulders and so forth uh, widened. They're already widened a bit west of 58th Avenue. That was done back when the 58th Avenue was done and improved and, and widened. So they're going to continue those widened lanes to the project entrance and about 50 feet beyond it and then taper back to the existing lanes uh, to the west. Uh, that's that's what's proposed with this project. Okay. But, right. but to say that no traffic is going to come from the west, I think, is, is you know, I, I, off kilter there. I mean, people live out to the west. There's going to be people riding their bicycles to the school, walking, and it, that road's very narrow. You can hardly put two cars on it at, at this point because I jog out there every morning. The other issue I have, obviously, is that I don't want a school to go in directly across the street from my piece of property. I moved out west to get away from schools and things like that. I knew there was a housing development that could go in across the street. I don't have a problem with that. But I spent over a million dollars on my piece of property and my house out there and it never had any intention of a school being out there directly across the street from here. I wouldn't have built out there. Um, I know schools are the cornerstone of the community and, I, and I've heard all that kind of stuff, but when that, something like that comes about, it's, in my opinion, up sort of like where Liberty Magnet School is, where the, the school's built and the community's built around the school, not where a school comes and is crammed into an existing residential community. Uh, where a housing development was planned directly across the street. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Yes, sir. Hello, my name is Ron Lamer. I live in the uh, same subdivision Jeff lives in. Actually, I can agree with what Jeff said. Uh, what was your last name? I'm sorry. Lambert. Lambert. I thought so. My parents live across I know, the I know. I just, I'm letting, doing this for Rita, Ron. Okay. <laughs> What's the first name? It's Ron. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I do oppose. I mean, I'm pro-school. I'm pro-children. I have three myself. Uh, I'm on a school board at a small uh, Christian school. Um, actually, it's smaller than this one will be. It's down the street at uh, First Church of God Masters Academy there. And similar to this school, there's no buses because it's private. And you get a lot of, uh, you know, every child has to have, be brought there by their parents. So you get a lot of traffic and it increases the traffic quite a bit so I was concerned about 4th Street also because the uh, you know cars from the west going east if there's no left turn lane they all got to wait there for a gazillion cars turning left to get in so there's no way to get around and 4th Street is very narrow but there's really three reasons why you know I'm opposed to it and basically the main one is that uh, it's going in right adjacent to a bunch of existing homes you know, there. If you look back, like Jeff mentioned, Liberty Magnet School, and a lot of the schools you think are built first, and there's no houses around them. I had some aerials I could put up, but I looked at like an aerial of Liberty, Liberty Magnet School. I looked at one at Oslo Middle School, um, and even Masters Academy. There's we had to do the same process with that school. You know, with the uh, getting a special exception because the same zone. No, actually, it's agricultural zoning, but we had uh, two neighbors. One, you know thousand feet away another one like five thousand feet away but that was it um, and that went forward but this one there's you know a string of homes along the, the whole border and I think it's a little you know unfair to them uh, it could reduce their their market of buyers I mean everybody loves schools and children but there are gonna it, it will make a smaller number of buyers for those homes who don't want the noise and the commotion and the party bells and things of that nature going off but 
That's uh, probably the main reason. The other reason would be um, just the the uh, the excess traffic. You know, same with Jeff. You know, I live across the street, and just you know that with the the, the traffic wall to deal with. But anyway, I mean, seven. There's 300 cars that matches academy. 300 students that matches academy. I know there every morning and afternoon. It's very busy, and with 750, it's going to be extremely busy there in the drop off and pick up. So anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else out kind of this side? All right. Let's try this side. Who else? Uh, kind of right in. Yes, sir. Come, come ahead. You won the lottery. Good evening. My name is Larry Wittemeyer. I live at 665 Carriage Lake Way, which is one of the backyards that abuts on this property. Uh, I've noticed uh, the backyards in this particular area, Pine Tree Park, Carriage Lake, have one thing in common, the ones that back up to this property, and that is that they uh, are quiet and they're private. I think this brings up for me uh, the cluster of property rights that we all enjoy when we purchase a property or decide on a property in a certain area, and within those rights are the right to quiet enjoyment, and one that I like even better, is the right to be left alone. I just have to think that 750 students back there are somehow going to diminish this right to quiet enjoyment of our property, uh, especially if any of these students have a voice like my daughter had when she was in grade school, which we could hear her practically at home uh, when she was out of recess. The question comes to my mind from watching the, the very fine display that the, the committee put on uh, uh, as we were beginning is, is this the right parcel for this particular activity? It sounds like we're quite a ways down the road on this project. I'm just somebody who got one of these notices a couple of weeks ago, came over to let you know what, what I thought. Is this parcel the right, right parcel for this project? It, it looks like a bit of shoehorning is going on. Uh, we drove over and took a look at the Charter High School, and that seems to be a, I didn't have my tape measure or anything, but that seems to be a much larger parcel, and you have a, a uh, quite a collection, an eclectic collection of buildings and activities and uh, goings on at that particular uh, site. I'm just wondering if this parcel that we're talking about here is too small to try to do what Imagine Schools, I think, wants to do. There are unanswered questions. I particularly like the question about the barriers and the nature of the barriers. I think that's an excellent point. The points about traffic and road access, all excellent in my view and things that I certainly had on my list to ask about. And in closing, I'll just say that uh, this was set up as a subdivision of private residences, single family residences. And uh, I think the planners got it right when they set it up in that manner. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, see a hand? Yes, sir. Come on ahead. Come ahead. <clears throat> My name is Tahir Husseini. I'm next door neighbor. I'm the one who is affected the most. Um, I agree with everything has been said, but also one important point, as we know, a charter schools fail, and many of them fail, and they close down for various reasons, financial and others. And if that's built, and then, God forbids, or whatever, fails, then we are left with a big skeleton, and they don't know what to do with it. This was intended to be a residential subdivision. Now it's going to be a charter school. If charter school fails, what is going to be next? So the problem, we are left with a big skeleton. These people want to sell for any price if it doesn't work. Whoever comes will buy their, buy, their side to him. And then that will deteriorate the neighborhood even further. Thank you. Could you, excuse me, sir, could you spell your last name for Rita? You got I, it? I yeah. owned a portion of oh, no, that. No, just, we just need your name for the record. Oh, my name is Taher, T-A-H-E-R, Husseini, H-U-S-A-I-N-Y. I wasn't going to try. I thought you had better do That's that okay. yourself. Yes, sir. Right, we, we understand where you are. Thank you. We hear you. Um, Anybody else back here? Yes, back, yes, sir. Uh, Christian Cascone with Imagine Schools, uh, 15220 Hartwood Marsh Road, Claremont, Florida. 
Uh, I just wanted to mention that all of these concerns that were raised are, are valid concerns, and I think uh, a lot of the a lot of the concern and fear comes from the unknown. And what we've done is uh, we've started having community meetings. We had one uh, last week to address the concerns as they come up. And and I just wanted to mention briefly <clears throat> that um, you'll see behind me a lot of yellow shirts and a lot of parents. And and this is our team here that's been working diligently on this project. And there's there's a lot of support and a lot of reasons for why I imagine is here and we're very excited to be part of this community not the least of which is choice for the parents of Indian River um, that's what charter schools are all about um, but I wanted to address a couple specific concerns that were mentioned this evening we're a nonprofit uh, we're very blessed we're funded by a philanthropist named Dennis Bakke and um, there's substantial financial backing in this effort we're one of the largest and fastest growing charter school organizations in the country and we have 11 schools currently and about 10 more coming in Florida. Um, there's two planned for Indian River. Um, and this one specifically was chosen, this location was chosen uh, because we are breaking the mold of what folks traditionally know about schools. Um, we want to be true neighborhood community schools. We don't want to buy 50 acres in the middle of nowhere and bus kids 10 miles to get to school. Um, this this uh, school may very well have buses. Uh, it may not. That's up to the principal. But uh, the idea it was that we usually build on eight to ten acres, which is what we usually do. We're doing one on seven and a half in Flagler, is to make it a smaller, more neighborhood community school where a lot of kids can walk the way they used to, um, and be right in the middle of the areas of greatest need. So that is intentional uh, that the school is located there. And this site is actually quite large at 17.4 acres for us. Um, but any concerns, and, and they are valid, that come up, uh, myself and our team are, are available to, to address them. Um, Joe Mills is here, our new principal, and he gives out his personal cell phone, as does his assistant. And uh, there's also websites available, and we are always open to questions and, and addressing concerns. The landscape buffer on the um, north side of the property is naturally significant, and we intend to do the same thing. Uh, on the other lengths. So I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in the kind of the center section care to speak? Over here? That's it? Okay. Uh, Al, just, yeah, come on up. I haven't been sworn in yet. I, I, want, I, I, I want to make a statement. Right. Could you, um, you need to be sworn in first, Al. Okay. Rita, you need to, you have to swear him and the lady, please. too. Do you swear or affirm? Excuse me, just a second. Ma'am, would you, if you're going to speak, you need to be sworn in. Yeah. Okay. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. My name is Hal McAdams. I live at 540 61st Avenue. My property uh, backs up to this Road. development of the charter school. I've listened to neighbors I haven't met yet, but uh, I'm one of those who uh, believes in charter schools. I feel that uh, there's an opportunity for schools in this county. I work for one. And, uh, you know, I truly feel that there is uh, a time and a place for everything. I have my only concerns with the charter school is that they protect my interest with my home and that interest being that they don't interfere with my home and my property value that they uh, maintain the uh, drainage that is uh, necessary for that large of a parcel I built my home 22 years ago when there was a grove there and uh, I really enjoyed the citrus grove behind my house. I was sorry to see that it left. I knew that the other development wanted to build one acre parcel home sites. I accepted that. I am accepting the idea that uh, the school has a vision. And I believe that as long as they abide by all the things that are necessary to protect their neighbors, then it is a good thing. Hal, let me ask you a question because you know this property as because of your house. 
with the drainage in that area, which has been up and down all through that, where the smaller lots are to the west, even where you are, yes. would the drainage in this actually improve the area or not with this drainage, with this well, retention pond? Or has this, this area never had a problem? Well, what has happened, it hasn't had a problem, and provided that they don't change the structure, uh, when this land was redeveloped for the subdivision, a lot of fill was brought in from next door from another subdivision and built up. My home, when I built it, was the highest point on the street at one time, and now uh, I look out from my uh, back door and the elevation has changed dramatically. My, that's my concern. The that, water that's that I do not be infringed upon by changes that will cause damage to my home or loss of value. Fair enough. Isn't the uh, runoff supposed to be retained on site? It, y yes, it is. Thank you, sir. And and, and he's correct. It, you you can see from all angles that that this particular site was built up for with the subdivision development and then drained in internally and into the into the stormwater pond. That's the way that was it the was height of the sub. Is this what's it twenty one six that we have to build everything up to now? Well, it, that's it, part of the reason the subdivision was built up. Yeah, it would depend on the area, the, the actual elevation, but it's in a, it's in a floodplain. Pine Tree Park, I think, entirely is within a floodplain. So this. It, it, any new development like the subdivision development and then and then the school that gets approved will be it got cut and will be higher but but basically drain internally I see. okay uh, yes ma'am how the short answer was the runoff will be retained on site that, that's yes the requirement is is not to the adverse the hope effect. is it will be retained hope is, yes yes ma'am my name is Levon Walker, and I live at 510 61st Avenue, and I also own a house. Did you say Elon? Levon. Levon. Okay. Pretty name. Thank you. And I also own a house in the Highlands across from the elementary school. Okay. okay. And I live at this house because of that. There's noise all day long, kids playing, and it's quiet. My parents are older, and they're moving down here with me, and I just don't want a school back there. I have a house with a school. Okay. <laughs> we hear you. That's pretty clear. <laughs> That's pretty clear. Okay. Well, do you have a school in your backyard? I used to. Not far. But not now. Well, I already have one with. Right. So I, that's, that's my opinion on it. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Leanne Digby Bryant. I live at 420 61st Avenue. My greatest concern is the children's safety. I'm also a school teacher. Uh, I teach in the North County. <clears throat> and there is very little room for people to go um, if they're traveling on 4th. There's a very large ditch. Uh, we hear the sirens sometimes because people on motorcycles have been in the ditch. Um, they were probably speeding and not doing what they should be, but I'm worried about children on bicycles and cars trying to avoid them. And that is that is my concern because I want the kids to be safe. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, hi. My name is Anthony Galanto. I live at 430 61st Avenue. And I've only been living here for approximately six months. Um, I moved to the neighborhood because I thought it was going to be a nice, quiet neighborhood with homes. I do power walk on 4th every day, and I have jumped out of the way of more cars on that road. So nobody understands. The gentleman who is in favor or actually promoting this whole deal said he wants kids riding their bikes and wants them walking and all that. can't happen. It cannot happen on that road. You're going to get a kid killed, and there's no way around this. Just going to the school entrance does not work in this situation. Um, beyond that, you guys are going to decide what you want. There's no way whatever we say is going to really probably impact it enough. But you really got to widen that road farther than the entrance of that school. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, yes, ma'am? Did you want to speak? You, um, you, 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 we swore you in, so you may as well... <laughs> Swear at us. 
probably. I'm Nancy Galanto. I live at 445 61st Avenue. And I have to agree with what everybody else says. The roads are way too narrow for children to be walking on. Um, there's not good drainage in that area for a school to be built. And I just have to agree with what everybody else says. It's just not going to work. We, we came here to live in quiet privacy. And we have nature and beauty. And you take in paradise and putting up a parking lot. We don't want it. Thank okay. you. Thank you. I remember that song. Uh, any other, anybody else in the public before I close the public hearing? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, she needs to be sworn in. I'm sorry. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? My name is Shelley Doherty. I live at 5315 East First Square Southwest, and I, too, am a teacher in the county. I have three children. My oldest will, twins will be going into fifth grade this fall, and... I'm doing something that I never thought I would ever do, and I'm pulling them out of a fabulous public school because I have fear for their safety going to middle school. I do not want my children being bused all the way up to Gifford. As you all know what's going on in Gifford, and I love Gifford, and it's a fabulous school, but I am very hopeful that it will be a middle school. When I first moved here, I was told that the county was going to build a middle school south side, south county, and it's not going to happen. We just don't have the money. So um, you guys are talking about the safety of our children, and that is my main concern, is that I do want my kids to go to a community school, a community middle school, and I don't have that option where I live. There is no community middle school where I live. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Yep. Did you stand to be sworn earlier? I thought so. Okay. Thank you. My name is Ryan Rusnak. I'm a planning consultant with Imagine Schools, and and uh, along with this project, I have the pleasure of working with them on several other projects. Um, you know, as planners, we we kind of get a little nostalgic about the integration of uses um, as opposed to the separation of uses that residential here, commercial here, institutional over here, and and the projects throughout Central Florida that we've worked on, uh, they've really taken that effort. Uh, in order to integrate within the neighborhood. So you do give the offer, uh, offer the children the opportunity to uh, walk to the school or, or their short traffic trips as opposed to driving uh, across town. Uh, I don't think one of the things was uh, pointed out that there is pedestrian access to the north of the property. There's, there is a right-of-way that terminates, uh, and there's certainly the ability to access the property there. Uh, certainly institutional uses are, are, can be appropriate uh, within residential uses. And, and as a planner, I, I state they can be appropriate. And the two things that I would mostly look at um, is intensity of the use uh, based on the size of the property, as well as adequate buffering and setbacks, which I both believe uh, uh, these have. Um, and certainly I would agree with the, the expert testimony outlined in the staff report uh, in their recommendation for approval. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I um, just wanted to point out that this is a good location for a school. I mean, neighborhood schools should go in neighborhoods. I had this discussion with Mr. Keating, and I, I believe he agrees with me, and that's why the staff has recommended approval. Your ordinances permit schools in neighborhoods. That's why we are here. And the ordinances provide for uh, buffering and other protective devices to ensure the compatibility with the neighborhoods. I understand that wherever you put a school, if there's a lot of surrounding property owners, some of them will object. But Pine Tree Park is huge. You have a minute sampling of residents from Pine Tree Park here tonight. Bef um, so ha having said that, before we close the public hearing, I just want to know if you needed to talk to our traffic engineer uh, we, or, or That's my next question. Yeah. Okay. Or our, right. our drain, you know, project engineer for drainage. So. Get him on the record. Thank you. Who, who do you want? <laughs> um, I'd like to, Brian, if, if there's no other public comment, I would like to talk Brian to come up and talk about traffic for a minute. Cause, yeah, one, one, one. I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Come in. My name is Carol Widemeyer, 665 Carriage Lakeway. Um, I, one thing that disturbed me is I, I did a, a search on uh, the Internet 
for Imagine Schools to check on it, and I noticed something there that said, welcome to uh, South County Schools, home of the Manatees, opening August 2008, like it's a pre-gone conclusion. Um, and uh, I found that disturbing right away. Uh, I, I would like to know exactly then if they're planning on enrolling now, um, <coughs> what kind of timeline, what kind of buildings you're going to put up, what timeline is it before you, there are regular schools there, what, it, what's, what is it going to look like um, in the next few years, and what kind of commotion are we going to have if they have already <laughs> decided that they're opening this August? The guy Thank behind you. you will be able to answer your question. Pardon me? The man behind you will answer your question. Uh, I could just, I'm just going to put this right here. So that, uh, Charlie. Uh, my name is Charlie Wilson, 1057 Sixth Avenue in Vero Beach. I just wanted to say that we, um, I, I'm working with this company, and they do want to be good neighbors. Remember, people choose to go to these schools, and they only choose to put people where their kids are safe. Uh, we um, had a community meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago at the Emanuel Church where we invited all of the neighbors. We sent 2,000 invitations to all of the neighbors within almost a half a mile of the location. Um, we had about 50, 55 people come. A lot of them had questions. A lot of them had the same questions that have been asked here. Um, by the time we were through, we were able to assuage their their concerns, and uh, I'm sure we'll be able to do that uh, with, with the rest of the neighbors also. Uh, this is a very good project, and uh, the county needs it very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any more public comment? If, if not, I'd, we'd like to ask some questions of the applicant. If, in, if there are any more questions, I won't close the public hearing until after the fact, if you would need to say anything else. All right, Brian, come. Let's talk about traffic because yes, I, sir. I'm one of those. I drive down Fourth, and I've probably dodged both of these guys a couple of times. And I, it's uh, there is no question that that is a, a narrow and dangerous street. I mean, the houses are. I, I have no idea how we're going to get the right of way to wind it without condemning a bunch of houses. Either that, or we're going to have bus stops at somebody's front door. Uh, so I, I, I appreciate the neighborhood school part of this, but Fourth Street is a tough street, and I, I, I'm kind of I'm like the rest of them. I'm still thinking about the left turn lane if we do this, and well, kind of the rest of that road. What are we going to do? Because I don't believe anybody's kids. I, are coming I know there's here. been a lot of claims regarding traffic from the west, and there's going to be a significant amount of traffic from the west. Um, that's not supported by the distribution model nor the county traffic department. I do have an aerial just to kind of get an idea of rooftops. Do we have to uh, put it on the Elmo? It, Does somebody it, have, have can somebody it. run the Elmo tonight? Unfortunately, I'm not <laughs> yeah. capable. Okay. We have a local in-house We have our local in-house expert. Good. Did you run the projector in high school? <laughs> He's on the AV squad. He's on the AV squad. Yeah. Can you zoom out a little bit more? A little bit more. That's that's good right there. Let me get my stuff from over on this. Uh, what, what we're looking at is just a very while you're there. But how far out? Do, what you might point out where the, the urban serve the urban service area goes out there. Because it goes around that whole area of houses, doesn't it? Yeah, unfortunately, I do not have the urban service boundary delineated within the aerial. Um, staff could probably speak more cognitive about the location of the urban service boundary. Right. <clears throat> the urban service boundary is uh, on the north side of 4th Street. You may want to do it up on the Elmo stand. Okay. Right. The urban service boundary in the location, this is 58th Avenue. Uh, the urban service boundary runs along the north side of 4th Street over to 66th Avenue and up. Essentially, it covers this area where Pine Tree Park is. You see all these planted lots. It covers this um, half square mile section, and then uh, the rest of it's on the east side of 58th Avenue. This is one of the few spots in the county where it's actually west of 58th. That's, that's correct. And so as you go further to the west, west of 66th Avenue, so it's all one unit per five acre. Uh, you get all the way out uh, by 82nd Avenue uh, and beyond the same thing. 
So based upon the existing rooftops and the future development potential outside of the urban service boundary, uh, staff concurred that approximately less than 10% or 10% of the project trips would be coming from western portion of the county or west of the project site. Based upon looking at 10% of the traffic in ingressing into the project site, during the AM peak hour movement, there's projected to be 15 left turning movements during the AM peak hour. During the PM peak hour, there's projected to be nine left turn movements. Why, why, do you, why are left turn lanes desirable? Well, I'm sure the board knows, but for everyone else, left, <laughs> left turns are, are, are a benefit to communities that relates to capacity, such that you, when you have opposing westbound traffic, a vehicle that's looking to make that left turn can get out of the way of any eastbound traffic that desires to progress on so that excessive delay doesn't occur along that portion of the corridor. When you look at the peak hour through movements that would correspond, that would oppose that left turn movement, during the AM at build out year of this year, 39 through movements during the AM. So essentially less than one vehicle a minute would oppose that left turn movement in the morning on average. Um, during the PM, there's 105 through movements during the peak hour. That's approximately less than two vehicles a minute to, that would oppose those nine left turns. Based upon those numbers of through movements and turning movements, it does not exceed the county's warrants to justify uh, the addition of a, a left turn lane into the project site. The project site does have the burden of constructing uh, a westbound right turn lane right. into the project site as well as it's my understanding that the project has the burden of improving 4th Street to the western property line yeah. of the project site then bring it up to current county standards. The other, the other part of that, Brian, though, is that, that with that road the way it is, it also goes out on 58. Now, this is probably not a traffic engineering uh, expert advice, but in case you haven't ever made that light when it happens to turn green every now and then to go across 58, you're going to be in a hurry to get to that light, and you don't want a guy in front of you turning left. So, I mean, I, 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 if we're going to do this, we're going to probably end up with a left turn lane. I mean, I just can't see forth without it myself. I, I, just, I, 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 you I know. can tell you that based upon the, the number of turning movements, it, it does not... I, I, the numbers and all, I, I understand engineering-wise, it doesn't even come close. Yeah, it, it doesn't. It really doesn't trip the, le the lever, but... I, there's common sense attached to this that, that we all well, have I don't know about a massive that. experience with. And but not a lot of common sense, sense for me. But well, my common sense may be different than yours, but today it's the same. Uh, <laughs> you all have anybody else have a question to Brian? I, 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 what about the sidewalks and things leading into it and, and uh, bicycle paths? I mean, I, I think these are essential. I, mean, oh, I, I, I would ask Bruce to speak to the sidewalks improvements on 4th Street. Uh, good evening, Bruce Molina, uh, 2455 14th Avenue uh, with MBB Engineering. Um, obviously, sidewalks is, is important. This is a school. Uh, you know, I'm sure a lot of us, uh, I know I did, used to ride my bike to school, you know, all the time, in elementary school all through uh, junior high. Uh, what we're doing on this project is, and as you can see from the aerial, most of the houses are to the east and to the north. So we have constructed a, uh, an eight-foot wide bike path to come from the north uh, off of 61st, so all those kids can come down that 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 local road where it's nice and safe, coming through the back of the property and ride their bikes to the school or walk. Uh, obviously, that should be encouraged. This is a school in the urban service area. It should be encouraged to be walked to or biked to. Um, we are actually going to be tearing out a portion of the sidewalk on 58th Avenue because it's not wide enough. We don't feel it's safe enough. So we're going to tear out a couple hundred feet of sidewalk on 50 on Fourth uh, Street, and reconstruct a seven-foot safer sidewalk from the entrance all the way uh, east to 58, because we feel that this sidewalk that's out there now is not going to be safe enough. So we'll be having a seven-foot wide sidewalk coming from the east from 58 all, all the way, way to 58. There's a small portion that that yeah, is seven the... foot from 58, a little bit to the west. But there's a large portion that's only five feet wide. We'll be tearing that out and putting oh. in seven feet. So okay. you have a seven foot from 58th all the way to the project entrance for 90% of the kids coming to this site. 
We'll be extending the sidewalk past west of our entrance all the way to the west edge of our property. And we'll be doing the roadway improvements from our over 300 feet west of our project entrance. We'll be adding shoulders. We'll be adding the proper lane widths to improve what we believe right now is an existing unsafe condition. So you have the condition now. There's no question. It's going to change if this doesn't happen. But we're going to improve that. We're going to add shoulders. We're going to add the proper lane widths for over 300 feet west of our project entrance all the way down to 58. So we feel we're improving the safety of the road, improving and providing safe access for children, for pedestrians and bicyclists. How far? 300 feet to the west of your project? Yes, because we have to transition down. But during that transition, the lane widths will be 12 feet, and they will be having shoulders. Do you all own the property in the corner there? This, this home southwest or? corner, three hundred feet west of their entrance. Of the entrance. Oh, I, know. I just wondered who owned that property in the. the it's it, well, it works in the right of way, so ah. we we actually fall short of, of the it's the, the next driveway. Um, we won't it, it's uh we won't be affecting anybody's driveway or anything like that. But all the work is in within the existing right of way. This uh, project has donated has uh, provided for the ultimate right of way for Fourth Street. So you have a hundred and. Oh. 30 feet of right away now in front of our property that you never had before. Is, it, um, is there any require any regulation or whatnot? I mean, do we have any problem potential of parents dropping off kids on 61st if there's a line of people uh, going yeah. in to, to dro drive down and drop them off to walk in the back? There's no way for them to turn around. I think that'd be kind of awkward. Well, I, I'm, I, I just it's something. I don't know how you regulate that, but I just think there ought to be a prohibition if you're going to end up doing this. So. Because, I mean, Hal's right, I mean, in the sense that generously he said he's not objecting to this in the sense that you don't affect his property, but that'd be kind of in their lap. Wouldn't, it sure would be inconvenient to do that. I think you've got to go a pretty circuitous route to get there. It would be a lot easier just to go up 4th Street. It's just yeah, if it's crowded. That, that would be securitous, but if you're that close, then your child would probably walk or bike. Okay. Could, could, could you show us on the map where these paths are? I'm a little confused. Yeah. Maybe it's me, but do you all want to plan? The aerial yeah. back up. Actually, if you use the aerial, I That's think it might be easier. In, in the previous development, which we were the engineer of, the Parrot Bay development, that was going to be used as an emergency fire e uh, ingress and egress. And now it's 61st. Be, that was just going to be a pedestrian. Right, 61st was, yeah. Right. Where are you at? Okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I might. Right. Uh, Bruce mentioned that uh, the, the kids don't, hmm, don't like that. The kids don't have to walk down 4th Street. In fact, we don't expect most of them to walk down 4th Street. They're, <laughs> I can't use this here, this Elmo. This is, there's going to be an entrance right here with the sidewalk. All the, any of the kids from this neighborhood here can, will be coming in this way. So it's not, you know, I think you got the, the, the way, if you just listen to the testimony, you thought every kid that went to the school is going to have to walk down 4th Street or ride his bike down 4th Street, right, which okay. is not true. And I agree that wouldn't be safe, although I have to tell you, I used to have to ride my bike down Biscayne Boulevard to get to my elementary school. <laughs> so. Bruce, I have a question. Uh, are you, you going to have sidewalks or bike paths or anything along the street that, that parallels this on the north? What is the street? If you took Carriage Lake Way and, and had to go all the way west, what is that street there? It's not Bruce. I don't know. Yeah. Which we're not planning to connect into Carriage Lake. Okay. If you're planning on having all the children access this project from the north, are there any sidewalks being built on the north? Yeah. No. no. The only thing we're doing is connecting to that, that minor local road where there's hardly any traffic. Okay, but you're saying you're building the sidewalks on 4th, but you said you don't expect that the children will be accessing the school from 4th. I didn't you say that. I said they can access it from either way. Right. He's saying the most. But we'll provide, instead of having them walk on 4th Street, we're going to provide them a safe, you know, bicycle path so they can come in. We think, I mean, if you look at the area, most of your rooftops are to the east. They're going to come down 58th and they're going to come in off of 4th Street. And if they're in that neighborhood uh, to the north, they can come right down the, uh, the bike path that way. 
And that's not even included in and you, we, the trips that are in the traffic study don't even assume any of that. So right. the, the trips are going to be even less than what the traffic study shows because the pedestrian you know, uh, connection isn't even considered in the traffic study. It's assuming everybody's driving to the school. And we know that's not going to happen. And it shouldn't happen. Well, you say all most of the children will come from the east. Then you mean they will be driven there well, by their parents. Be, right. That's why they're, they're close the right enough, they're going to ride their bikes. So. I would imagine, or walk. Yeah, but what about in, in, in clement weather? The parents are going to be driving their uh, students to school. Possibly. There's 750 students going to this site. Uh, Brian, did you anticipate how many trips that would be? Uh, parents dropping their kids off? During inclement weather? Uh, anytime. And especially in inclement weather is going to make it even worse, obviously. The Institute of, of Transportation Engineers studies school sites. Yeah. And based upon their data sampling and studies of, of the school sites, they generate equations to generate vehicular traffic associated with different development intensity. It, you know, it, and my, answer, my claim would be, you know, it takes into account the, the kids that ride their bike in school because I'm assuming, I didn't actually collect the data myself, but I'm sure that the schools that were sampled had kids that walked to school, that biked to school, that were bus to school, that would then reduce the vehicular traffic associated with that particular school site. Well, there's not going to be any busing to the school. Most of the kids are going to be... I think, the, I think the, there was a statement made earlier that it's left up to the principal regarding the busing. I can't speak to whether there is or there isn't, but I think someone had made the That would be private clear. busing, right? Obviously. That would be private buses? I'm sorry. I just take care of the traffic engineer. I just do the traffic. I, I can't speak to... It's a, it'd, yes. be, it'd be I'm a getting, it'd getting be yes from the principal. Private. They'd hire buses out. We, uh, we are a public school for all intents and purposes. So we have both uh, uh, worked with districts to provide busing, and we can also outsource the busing. But it's traditionally the way you would see it in a public school big yellow buses, and it's just it, the decision as to how many buses is up, left up to the principal contingent on need. While you're here, uh, the other sites, um, that schools you have are five acres and so on. How many students go to those schools? We have, uh, well, I can give you a couple of immediate examples. There are between six and 800 students in Orlando. Um, there are five right now, and uh, those all have buses right now. And those are on five-acre sites? No. Those are on varying sizes. Uh, the average site that we build on is between eight to ten acres, and that would be average. Five hundred to six hundred students, then between six hundred and eight hundred on that uh, site, depending on between four hundred and fifty and seven hundred and fifty, depending on the school. That's what we have right now. And there are eleven of them in Florida that can be looked at. We can provide you that data. Anything else, Bruce? Just. Yeah, um, I know drainage came up. I just right. wanted to address the drainage real quick. Um, when we uh, originally designed this as a subdivision, of course, everybody knows that was a grove where there was the runoff was direct. I mean, I'm sure for years when it was an active grove, it was direct, carrying a lot of pesticides that went directly into the canal. Um, what you have on that site is perimeter ditches that go to pipes that go under 4th Street into the big canal there, uh, the Indian River Farms Canal on the uh, south side of 4th Street. Um, when the development came in, uh, or started construction as the residential development, of course they came in, brought fill, uh, and cleared the property, and you see as it is today, it's cleared with some minor improvements. Um, the perimeter ditches are still in place along the property boundaries so that water is not going into the neighboring properties. But it, it's when this is finished, you know, if this is built and this is finished finally, all of the water will be directed to that very large stormwater pond that you see in the front, which is oversized, one, because it's in a, uh, it was in a 100-year floodplain, so it had to be bigger to accommodate the, uh, it had to compensate for the fill of where the water used to be stored, and then also because it's uh, in an indoor farms, it can only discharge a two inch over a 25-year storm. So it's an extremely large pond, and all the uh, drainage will be going to it. So we believe that the, um, the drainage pattern will be much, much improved when it's complete. Much better than it was with, in the With regard years. to the, my question when I mentioned to Bruce earlier about buffering, can the site handle 30 feet in an A type buffer on the west and the south, southwest corner? <coughs> along the southwest. Around the house. And then along what would be the west side? Well, I guess. 
Possibly. I mean, I'm think looking at your been, space to me. From I'm not the engineer. I think with the space, wise, it, it's possible it could accommodate it. I, I think that we obviously you've seen the plan. Where we did provide the upgraded buffers right. and, and what's required. So, um, could it handle it? I guess there's room for it. If, if okay. It, Thank you. Yes, sir. Good evening, board members. Doug Vitunak. Attorney for the applicant, 756 Beachland Boulevard. I'm an associate of Bruce Barquettes, and um, I just want to address uh, the, the turn lane. I, I hope we've addressed it adequately in talking about the numbers and that they, they just don't require it. And I want to express that this is an opportunity for the county that you don't see come along very often. We've got a wealthy benefactor who wants to basically give the community a school which could cost, I mean, it, it's, it's millions of dollars to this community. It turns into jobs for teachers. It turns into school choice for kids. It turns into uh, construction jobs. And I'm not sure if everybody's aware about what a, a requirement of a turn lane might do to the project. I don't, I don't think everybody realizes how expensive it is when you click your turn signal and pull off to the left into a turn lane. In this case, the best estimates, and uh, Brian Good can back me up, are somewhere around three to four hundred thousand dollars added expense. And if it's not needed by the traffic studies, it, it would just be uh, r ridiculous to, to hold this project back and to hold that money back from this community out of skepticism, and I understand the concerns of neighbors, and we want to address those as best we can. They, they should go to the website. They should start emailing us and calling us, and we're very open to that. Um, I, I just respectfully ask that you take that expense into consideration and uh, look at this as a benefit to the community. It, it, you know, school choice at a time like this has never been more important, in my opinion, and uh, that. That's what I wanted to say. Thanks. Don't, don't go away, Douglas. Okay. Uh, the studies that are used here are originated through a formula, which I've for years been saying the formula is broke. If we had a formula that was working, we wouldn't have the traffic problems we have now. That's why we question the use of a blank formula. Just throw that formula out there and whatever bubbles up is the answer. The practical experience tells us something other than that. That's why we're questioning it. I understand, we understand a few very much the cost of what, and you know, the circumstances, but, but just so you understand where we're coming from, we see that daily where the formula doesn't work. Oh, right, and I understand. I've heard you say that, and uh, there are probably many instances where that's true, but just, uh, I think from looking at the aerial, I think that's important. There's, there's farms. It's not an urbanized area out from the west. And it just makes sense to me that, that in this case, those numbers are probably right. And until we come up with a better a formula, that's that's the best we have. Yeah, I know. That's the standard. That. And I've also heard you say, you know, um, we need we need evidence to show us that this formula doesn't work. And I've also heard you say, you know, I would like a turn lane myself, but I'm going to abide by the standards in the code, and, and that's what's going to win the day. So it, it's a it's it's called it's coercion. Concern. Yeah, I know it, we know how it works. <laughs> okay, yeah, no, you know better, there, buddy. Uh, um, Bob, is there a method in something like this where it's because they are phasing this in over time? So or initially, the traffic will be less, to, much less to begin with. Is there a way to have a, a trigger that if 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 something proved that we were right and we needed a turn lane, so we don't require it to begin with, but later on it would be, it could be triggered or reviewed again. Free do a study at the second phase? Triggered yeah, by yeah. a traffic count? Yeah, I, th I think you could put that condition in, a monitoring condition for phase two. That would help me a lot to read. Right. We, read we could, we could. At phase two? Yeah, yeah, we could do that prior to issuance of a building permit for phase two. We could require them to submit a monitoring study. I mean the concern. The concern. The concern we both have, and I think that part of it is triggered by Fourth Street alone because it's just not. A, it's just a tough road. I understand your entrance, and Bruce. I. No, Mr. Chairman, we were oh, going to suggest the, that. We the main. The main thing is, is that you know, whether we, whether we have expansion further west of here or not, 
I assume that your demographics in marketing has looked at the area, and you probably figure your kids are coming from back toward 43rd Avenue. I mean, that's probably the area you're looking at. But the reality is, is that if you look at Maitland Farms and you look at the other schools out there, there there's there's been a more draw from some of the areas that have developed than sometimes we think of. Now, I, I happen to think Brian's very good at what he does. So uh, it, I understand the numbers, and I, I think the concern, though, is just a lot of it's that road. Oh, Mr. Well, Chairman, your suggestion is, is one that we were prepared to make. We were just sort of waiting for the right time to make it. But because that, that, that makes sense. I mean, then, then it's not, and I know Mr. Fletcher doesn't like me to say it's not flying by the seat of your pants. It's based upon evidence. And, and so what do you suggest? I'm flying fine by the seat of my pants. It makes, makes sense. And, and we were going to suggest that. We were just waiting right. for the appropriate okay. time. So thank you. But, Mr. Parquet, do you expect the numbers to change very much from what is projected now to then? Well, if they don't, then we're fine because, as Brian said, there's only nine left turn movements against 102 trips in a two hour period, and that's not going to be a problem. So, if that's what pans out, if that turns out to be true, then we will be back to you saying, see, we did your additional study, and it, our projections were correct, and no turn lane is required. If it's more than that, I mean, if it gets up to the 35 left turn movements that are required for a warrant or something if other I'm than not, that. If I'm not mistaken, and, and Lord knows I don't defend Bruce very often, but I'm thinking about fourth. Is it fourth or eighth? Where's the other um, elementary school is on eighth, correct? Citrus. There's one on eighth and one on is fourth. There, there is no left turn lane on eighth, is there? There is not. Right. I didn't th th there is one from the east to the west, but not west to the east, and they managed to make the turn. So, okay. I'll be happy right. with the thing about the I, I'm, I, we, tripping this. The we're we're phase, not going to go through everybody again, but Jeff, you did have your hand up, and you, if you had a comment, go ahead. I just didn't understand the if, if ten percent of the turns. I didn't know whether they were basing their initial traffic count on phase one or phase two. But but ten percent of seven hundred and fifty students would be seventy five cars coming from that it's one a, direction. A, we don't. You don't. We don't need a, the calculus tonight. But it's 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 the formula. I understand where he's coming from on numbers. It's My not. It's not that is, easy. <laughs> it's a two-page formula. Okay. Is there any more comments? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Got it down. Ah, wait. No. Come, come forward. You've got to be sworn in to speak. Come, come up to the mic, up to the podium. Come on down. And you can state your name and address after you've been sworn in. Rita, can you swear in? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? My name is Heather Vangenhoven. I live in 1916 21st Avenue. I do have a little brother, and I've had a lot of friends that go to the Tyro High School, and they've loved it. The teachers are, are amazing. And I would love for my little brother to go to the Phase 2 charter, or charter School because I've heard all my life that education comes first. And in that case, I don't understand why we can't take different routes to work to different schools and so on and so forth. So. If that makes any sense at all, why can't we just, you know, do what we have to do to build a different school for more kids? Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. No. Ron, what, this is it, because we, we're, we're rehashing here, guys, and, and we've got the picture, I think. I'll be real quick. Yes, so I was going to say, you know, I'm a commercial real estate broker. I've been doing that for 20 years here. And yeah. I'm for the school. I mean, I, I want to see a school come, too, just not here. I mean, there's a lot of other locations on King's Highway that I think would suit it much better. I mean, there's, and they can call me and I'll tell them where they are because <laughs> they're all over the place. Your so feet, I, right? I just thought this was kind of a distressed sale. It was a great deal and, that, and that's I understand. into it. Anyway, thanks. Yes, sir. Right. Just a second. Yes, sir. And then I'm, after that, I'm going to let Bruce speak and close the public hearing unless we have a pressing need. You need to be sworn. To Rita, we got one more. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. My name is Tom Funka, 1924 Westminster. I just wanted to point out that my daughter goes to Masters Academy, which is a pretty significant size school. We go in and out of there a couple times a day, and you don't even, there's not even an option of going west, and it's never been a problem. Okay. Um, also, a lot of talk about the, the proximity of the school. You can either build a school, and then the, the, the neighborhood builds around it, or you have the neighborhood and then put the school in, the end result is the same. OK. 
Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay, Bruce, anything else? Okay. Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, can I ask one question from Brian? I, 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 I wanted to beat the uh, clock on this. Uh, Brian, you said that there are uh, studies out there done by an institute that helps uh, create equations that tell you what type of impact schools are going to have on traffic or traffic zone. Um, Yes. The, these, these, these studies, I'm sort of curious, they study, does it specify which type of schools they study? Do they study public schools? Where, yes. Because, you know, I've, public schools have geographical limits, whereas I believe charter schools, there are no geographical limits. So I'm, I'm wondering how compatible are these studies if, if they look at public schools, which... It, it does uh, specify the difference between private schools and public schools. Mm -hmm. In the pre-application meeting with the traffic department, the county required us to use public schools as the land use classification for the trip generation with this project. Um, from my perspective, primarily because it results in a higher number than what a private school <laughs> land use classification would. Um, but that, there, there are the, that specification. There is not a classification for uh, charter school but, but or prime, yeah. magnet school, but it does have public-private. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Quick. All right. <laughs> public hearing is now closed. Commissioners, a uh, staff. May I? Mm -hmm. uh, what would be if the school did fail? Just for information, the, the question was asked. Uh, if the school failed, what would be the carcass use? Uh, <laughs> what, what would what would be able to go into that that site? Right. Well, the 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 use is limited to a, to a school. Okay, so that uh, unless, unless changed to, to some of the use that may have to go through a similar process to get approval to convert it, um, such as going to a church use. Um, if it were to be daycare, that would be a different use. Um, go back to it could go back to a different school, or it could sit vacant, uh, like could housing for residential. Excuse me. Could it go back to residential? Um, well, I, I, I don't Since think that. that I mean, if you if you took off the building, certainly the, the, the zoning will remain residential. Yeah, yeah. And this is it. Yeah. Right. This is a special exception used for it. So yes, it it would. Okay. Now a couple of questions about the phasing. Uh, this has this is a special use for us. Then this will go to the board, county commission, for the special use. Is that correct? Would you yes. define that that sequence for the public and me also the time phase it'll take. Yes, yeah, special exception uses require two public hearings, one before the Planning and Zoning Commission, one before the Board of County Commissioners. We've already advertised this for the April 29th meeting of the Board of County Commissioners. And as to phasing and time frame for the school, it's my understanding that the school's charter contract with the school district requires the school to be open in August. So they've got a pretty tight time frame for phase one. Phase two is, is completely and totally dependent upon them getting a new charter to go be, beyond the K-6 okay, or so K-5. K-5. So they have to present a site plan too, right? Not after this. Not after this? Right. This, this site plan is for build out in the event they do phase two. So you're seeing all the impacts, okay. the, the potential build out impacts. impact today. That's okay. correct. Right. Thank you, sir. Mm. Any yes. other? I have a question. Um, what are um, when do you plan on having 66th Avenue paved south of 60? I I I think we're hoping to do it this calendar year. I think there are only two or three right of way parcels that need to be acquired, and I think the design is is pretty close to being done. So the, the, the construction 66 from State Road 60 south to where it terminates going north from Oslo at about 5th Street Southwest is probably going to be done hopefully within the next year. Okay, I foresee a substantial amount of traffic then using 66th Avenue and coming up 4th Street to get access to this school. Do we have any right of way for additional lane on, on 4th? Um, Sidewalks, bicycle paths, anything on fourth? I, on fourth, we don't. But I still, we, we looked at this and evaluated it. We, we still don't think, even when 66 is open, that there's going to be that much traffic because everything to the west of 66 is outside of the urban service area. And uh, if you look north and south, most most of the development is closer to the King's Highway part. You know, almost everything is to the east. 
I don't think there's going to be. That's why I was asking about a trigger, another something when if it starts, then things happen before they hit phase two. Second study. Well, I agree with you, though, George. I've driven down forth. I went through that neighborhood looking at this, and and that is a very, very narrow road. I mean, you get a car and a kid on a bicycle, and you're crowded. Um, so what do you see as a remedy for that? Eight-foot sidewalk. Mm -hmm. But there's no way to put anything west on 4th. They can't do anything. They have no right-of-way, and the road, eventually that road will get cured, but it's not going to happen quickly. I think it's essential that it gets done. I mean, I just can't see. We're going to put... There's no sidewalk going on here, and you've got all these things. Then, then, this fourth isn't even on our map, isn't even on the plan to, to, to pave. I mean, you can say it's essential it gets done, but, I mean, 4th Street's not even in the, from the MP, and I don't believe it's not even yeah, on the. 25-year plan. It's, it's not in five years anyway, I don't think. It's wonderful it's to put a plan. school in a neighborhood, but we don't have safe access to that school. What you do from the north, I mean. Well, there's they, no sidewalks or anything up there either. There you go, being the street, realistic. The, again. the streets, this is not this is not a busy the busy I don't think those streets are that busy myself. Back in there. Well they're gonna become busy with the seven hundred and fifty uh, students. Oh, cool. Just if you think in terms of phase between get grades, this first phase is, is one through five and I don't remember how many kids. Five hundred. Five. But they said the goal was five hundred, four hundred. Right. Around probably four or five hundred. I, I think they have to achieve. from a traffic standpoint, you need to look at productions and attractions. And productions are, like Brian said, rooftops. So there just are not productions to the west that are going to be using the inadequate part of 4th Street. Almost all the trips will be coming from the east, where 4th Street is going to be improved to and past the entrance. So you don't feel that the rooftops are going to feed traffic into the school in that just in that neighborhood itself? I think. How many did you say, Mr. Parkett? There were like 700. Did you say in in that total that, build out? In that subdivision? Uh, I don't think I said. If I did, I was making it up. I don't think I said anything. Uh, no, there was a, a number mentioned and then a reference to only a small percentage of that I number said being here. It's a big here. neighborhood and there's only a small percentage of the people here, but I don't think I mentioned the number. Uh, no, you're right. You said Pine Tree Park is huge. Okay. Well, I'll speed it dark. Uh, any other uh, comments? Or? Another question, of staff. Do we have any ratio amount of students per acre for school? There was a 20-acre school, 500 students. A 30-acre plot would be 1,000 students. Or do we have any formula for that? Public schools or any schools? Generally, the Indian River County School District uses about 20 acres for an elementary school, and their their cap these days, I think, is about 750 students would be the maximum number of students in a school, and that would be on a 20-acre site. They have different acreage amounts for middle schools and high schools, and those are much larger acreages. Wall fields and et cetera. Huh? Yes, yes. The high schools. Yes. So we got 17.4 acres here, roughly 700 students, which right. is very close to what the public school, school would be. It, exactly. We, we looked, and, and this generally corresponds to what the school district. The charter requires. comes out of the school. school. The charter they got was proved here, right? Comes from the school board. School board. Right. Yeah. Well, we're not going to get it to them. Your staff report pointed out that the guidelines are 16 to 20 acres for a school of this site. That was in your staff report, so I pointed out the women. Thank you. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen. Oh, Mr. Chairman, I make a motion. Um, while I'm not happy about it, there's nothing legally holding these people back from doing what they want to do. I'd like to see the turn lane, but I move to adopt as presented with the caveat of the um, phase two, phase, phase the second phase study. Before the second phase is implemented, the new traffic study would be presented. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Just one question: Do we have the right of way for that? For for left turn lane. Yeah, I think we do. I do but three hundred feet. It's, it's a huge. Do we, gentlemen? 
I don't know if they know. I don't think we know. If, but if it becomes a requirement, they'll have to get it. To the best of my knowledge, today there's a 30-foot uh, in your Farmers Water Control District canal right away on the south side of 4th Street, and I believe it's a 30-foot roadway right away, which 4th Street resides today west of the project site. Yeah, the other 30-foot is all right. 30 feet all comes I'm, from the north. I'm sorry? The 30 feet will all come from the north side of the road, of 4th. If, if the canal is left unmodified, right. then all the right of way would be required to come from the north. The option would be to um, enclose the canal at the cost of the culverting to lessen that burden if that was evaluated in the future. Mm -hmm. All right, so you don't know if there we you don't think we have the right of way then, Brian, for that I, on the I, north that's side. That's my not the west of the project. Brian, in the in your site, your site's frontage on Fourth Street west of your entrance. There's not enough area there. So it's it's got to be close. <laughs> not it's got to be pretty close. Not today, west of the project site. No. Okay, but. Okay, any other discussion of the motion? Everybody understand it? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. aye. Okay. Delineation? We need to. Opposed, Donna. Donna's opposed. I, I, I like the idea of having the school there. And I think I like the idea of, of a neighborhood school. I have no problem with that, even though the neighbors are, have a problem with it. But I can't understand putting. Uh, a neighborhood school with no sidewalks or a bicycle paths. I think this is totally ridiculous. Right. And, that, and that, that has to be a judge. Uh, okay. And my objection is the same. We have to state what our objection is. is it, it's wonderful to put a neighborhood school in a neighborhood, but there is no safe access to it from pedestrian or bicycle traffic, for pedestrian or bicycle traffic. This is a recommendation of the Board of County Commissioners. They will have another hearing on this nice. issue on April 29th. Um, thank you all for coming. Good luck, guys. That's a problem out there. I'm yeah, it's, a, it's a safety issue for all of us. Especially with 66 and K. Yep. I'm, I have to admit I was torn. If, if you all could clear the area quickly, we would appreciate it. We've got several more items on our agenda. Thank you. about 66. The one, the reason I didn't hit it was that uh, the Eighth Street and the Elementary School. I'm, I, when I started thinking about it, it's got a lot more traffic than this. And it's no turn but you can't stop coming this way. I go by there a lot. And the car, they got the right to do it. Uh, uh, partway, it's just we're only under the current codes. We don't have any. Why do we I think the, I think these guys have targeted another area. Excuse me, could you all clear? Hello, hello. We're, we're not done here. We, we, we're just kind of waiting for you all to, to exit. So, thank you. Happy Thursday. Wouldn't do it if they had it. Okay. Next item on our agenda is the dis. The review of the draft of the Indian River County Comprehensive Plan Housing Element Evaluation Appraisal Report. Sasan. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, good evening. Yeah. <laughs> I know we talked. Like, uh, as you seen the evaluation appraisal report of different elements several times in the past few years, we are in the middle of preparing the evaluation appraisal report for the entire comprehensive plan. And local planning agency, who is the Planning and Zoning Commission, basically are responsible of preparing the evaluation appraisal report. And we have to submit the report to the DCA by December 1st, 2008. We have 15 elements and sub-elements in our comprehensive plan that we are preparing the evaluation appraisal report for. Before we bring any of these to you, usually we take them to different uh, group that are specialized in different fields. Like for example, housing would go to the housing group and the other one goes to that different group. And then we bring it to you for your review. And we start working on these in 2006 because again, we knew that this is going to be a long process to go through all of these things. Uh, basically, after uh, 
that you've seen all of these elements several times, eventually we're going to come to you sometime maybe in September or October in a public hearing, and that is the time that you're actually going to make recommendation to the board to approve it or not approve it, approve it with change. For the affordable housing, for the housing element, we have an affordable housing partnership group that they look at these elements since, again, 2006. Even this morning, they had a meeting that they look at it again, and this is ongoing. Also, the Board of the County Commissioner, they have to create affordable housing advisory committee that we are in the process of putting that group together, and they are going to look at these elements, too. For the housing, one thing that I really would like to bring to your attention is that most of the, of course, the emphasis and the production is from the private sector. Private sector and market they are the one that they said how much they're going to produce and the market price and all of these things. Really, public sector doesn't have that much control or how much they're going to produce and what the price is. In. But since we have very low and low and moderate income, as a public sector, we have to make sure that they also get to the affordable housing. And this is what our role is as a, private, as a public sector. This element, like any other element, was done through lots of research, and there is lots of data in the element. Like we have Appendix A and B, that if you look at it, you saw that there are so many data, and for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through all of those data. Bless but you. I just would like to bring to your attention a couple of the data, you know. Like of all of the housing elements in the county, 65% are an incorporated portion of the county. Of all of our housing, 66% are single family, 24% are multifamily, 10% are uh, mobile home. Eighty-five percent of the housing are occupied, and sixty-six percent are owner occupied, and nineteen percent renter occupied. Uh, again, as I mentioned, you know, our emphasis uh, for the affordable housing is to provide decent affordable housing for extremely low, very low, low and moderate income. And usually saying that we, no household should pay more than 30% of their income for a housing cost. In this table, you could see in the second column, those are the number of households that they pay between 30 to 50% of their income for a housing cost. And in the third column, they pay more than 50% of income for housing costs. And remember, these are the people extremely low income, very low income, and so forth. And if they have to pay that much of their, their income, like more than 50% for housing, there is not going to be enough money for food or for clothes or for medicine and so forth. And again, these are the group that we're really concerned about, uh, that they're paying that much of their income for the housing. Of course, the housing goes up and down. Like between 2000 and 2006, the median housing cost increased in our area 230%. In the same period, the median income only increased by 16%. And that, again, as you know, created a lot of big uh, problem. There were lots of factors that contribute to this increase, including artificially inflated demand. There are lots of investors, speculators, the subprime market, and so forth. Also, unfortunately, we had two hurricanes in 2004 that they increased the housing costs, increased the insurance, and also we know that taxes increase. Also, there is some government regulation. These are like the for quality of life. We like low density, low rise. We like more buffer. We like more landscaping. All of these kind of a thing would add to the cost of housing, of course. And when that thing happened, also what we call the essential service personnel, like a policeman, you know, teachers, nurses, you know, the municipal worker. Oh. 
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> They're the one that also be affected. Because regardless, we always going to have very low and low income people that they need assistance, they need affordable housing. But this group of people, if the housing is affordable and they are working, they should be able to buy their own home. They don't really need assistance. But when uh, the housing increased by 230%, then this group also going to be uh, impacted by that price. This table here would show you the different level of something being affordable or not being affordable. Okay, if home price to income ratio is 3%, 3 or low, that is affordable. If it's between 3.1 to 4, is moderately and affordable between 4.1 to 5, seriously and affordable, and of course more than 5 is severely and affordable. Now let, let's look at the, what happened in Indian River County. In Indian River County, even up to year 2003, the houses, they were affordable. We didn't have any problem. Then in 2004, it started to be moderately and affordable. And then 2005, 2006, and 2007 become seriously unaffordable. Of course, what's happening now is price going down. With the January 2008 prices, now again back to moderately and affordable. We are very close to that tree. And as a matter of fact, the price is still going down, and maybe very soon again we are going to be in affordable range. Of course, when all of these things happen, going up and going down, when the prices increase, it's making it an affordable for the new home buyer to buy the home. But it would be bad for the people that they have their own home. Because, you know, every one of us, or whoever has a home, they always like the value to go up. We all feel better, you know, especially for very low and low income people, they get a home equity loan, they have more money, they spend the money and they feel good about it. And for the rest of us too that, you know, our home is only investment that we have, we all feel good when it's go up. And when it start coming down, then we don't feel that good about it. Therefore, there's always balance between, you know, the people that are actually own their own home right now and the people that they want to buy the home. Of course, you know, we had a similar program in the county that we are trying to assist the people. One of them is our SHIP program, the HHR program, which is Hurricane Housing Recovery Program, CDDG program. Also, there is several rental houses that, rental project that they build, and all of them they need to get some sort of approval from the state, and we help them with forms and so forth to get those things. All together, there are over a little bit 4,000 units in the county that somehow they receive some assistance, some to get to those homes. Also, we have several strategies that currently we have, and since you are familiar with all of this thing, I'm not going to go through these strategies here, but these are all strategies that they could help with building affordable housing for the people that they need. In this evaluation appraisal report, we also look at some of the new strategies. The strategies that we show as a green, those are the ones that staff actually support them. Those that are in red, those are the ones that we do not support them. Again, you know, like for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through each of these things, but again, if you have a question, we could again talk about each one of them separately. Whenever we do any plan, we should have always a big picture. What do we want to achieve? And then we have to have some objectives that where we want to go. What are the target? What are the end that we are trying to achieve? And then we have to have some policies of how to get there. If we want to achieve an objective, then how are we going to achieve that objective? How are we going to get there? Next slide actually would define the goals, objectives, and policies. And objectives are a specific measurable end that we're trying to achieve. And policies are course of action to achieve that objective. Through this evaluation and appraisal report, 
we have to evaluate the objectives to see if we achieve the objective that we had in our plan, and also we have to look at the policies and see if the policies were implemented. And these are all in the report for each of the objectives and for each of the policies. In housing element, we have 10 objectives, and seven of them, they were achieved. Two of them, they were partially achieved, and one of them we did not achieve. Also, we identified all the policies that we have, and we have a recommendation which one to maintain, which one to delete, and if to add the new policy. Uh, this is again a chart that shows the objective one was not achieved, the rest of them either completely or partially achieved. Also in the last column we show that most of them, they need the target or target date or language need to be revi <coughs> revised. When you look at these EAR, the most important thing is, again, that big picture thing. Like, for example, for affordable housing, the big picture is that we would like to have affordable, safe, and decent housing for all county residents. This is the, what we want to achieve. Now we have to look at our plan and see if our current plan is sufficient to achieve that goal. Then we have to look at the objectives and see if the objective reflect the ends that if we get to all those ends, then we could achieve the goal. And then we need to look at all the policies and see if we have sufficient policy to achieve each objective. And then we have to make a determination how we're going to make our plan a better plan. Again, this is a brief overview of the housing element. For this housing element and for any other element, you're going to see them several times. And we really want to leave it up to you how detailed you want us to go through all of those things. If you want, we are ready to go page by page or policy by policy or objective by objective. Or if you would like the overview like that we did right now, we could do that one too. And again, I know that each element is going to be different and the interest of a different element is going to be different too. But again, we are 100% here to listen to you, and we would like to get your comment, and we would like to see again, how do you want us to proceed? Thank you. Thank you, Sasan. Um, any questions of Sasan? If, if not, I had one brief one for Bob that we get asked a lot up here, and this is the only area I, with the housing element was the only time I thought this would could be properly addressed. Is uh, It's kind of a... Di dichotomy between affordable housing and housing. We get asked a lot why we approve so many homes when there's so many empty vacancies. Should should we put a cap on housing out here, Bob? I, I think the, the county's role has been primarily to make sure land uses go where they should go, to make sure housing goes where it should, not to try to time the market and not to try to tell developers when they can build and when they can't build. In fact, what, what you'd have the tendency to do maybe is you would have the tendency maybe, I, I'm not sure, maybe even influence the market. Right, right now, as Sasan showed in his slides, the, the market is making corrections. The, this market got overheated housing prices, housing costs got way too high, and, and right now they're falling. And as a matter of fact, from the perspective of, of affordable housing, that's good. Like Sasan said, they, there's a balancing and there's a trade-off. Current homeowners liked seeing those prices go up. They like that 230% increase. That, that is just amazing, 230 yes. percent. It was artificially inflated, but what we're seeing right now is the, the price is coming back to reality. I have a sign that says, Dear Lord, don't let me miss the next bubble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the bottom line is I, I, I don't think there are many people out there that would like planners in general, planners in particular or government in general, to dictate when housing can be built, how much can be built, what kind can be built. 
place. But it is important to put housing in the right place, make sure that, that we have the infrastructure to accommodate it, and, and make sure it works. Let me while I've got the mic. So the answer to your question is we refer them to you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, actually, it is. Like, we, we do get asked that all the time. Right. right? We're to try right. and explain to them that we. But, but I, and, and I think the big picture uh, is, no, the, I think the big picture answer is property owners out there have rights. Yep. Everyone has a right to fail. Right. And the county is out there dealing with externalities. We, we are trying to deal with costs that development projects impose on society, outside costs, and we try to externalize that as much as possible. Or we try to put regulations in place that protect the public interest, the environment, infrastructure, and some of the other objectives that we have. I'm impressed. Let, let I me, thought you were just going to say, not my job, and move <laughs> on. <laughs> you, you knew it wouldn't. Let, let me just make a couple points. I, I, think, I think you might be able to get off easy tonight with the housing element. We don't need to go through objective by objective because you've got other committees looking at this, and you will see this one or more times. We will be bringing you some evaluation or appraisal report elements that you are the primary review agency for, and we're going to have to spend a lot more time and effort, and we're going to have to go through it in detail, and we're going to have to go through objective by objective and policy by policy. We're going to have to do that with the land use element. But let, let me just make a couple other points. This is this evaluation and appraisal report requirement is probably the best component of the state's growth management law. What what the state says is local governments have to step back after a period of time, in this case about ten years, and governments have to see is is your is the plan working? Take a look. Is it achieving what we, we tried to achieve? And and this is this is policy analysis. This is this should be the most important part of your job here. This is where you help the Board of County Commissioners set policies that get get codified into regulations, whether it relates to turn lanes or urban service area boundaries or what. So it's it's real important going through here to decide does our plan adequately guide us on where we should go? Those are the goals and objectives. And does it identify the actions that we need to take, the policies and strategies to get there? And, and I really encourage you to read this housing element and, and give us some good feedback. I think you, you – well, first of all, I'd be interested in looking at the age of uh, people that are living in these houses, if they're younger, older. Every one percent is over 65. Yeah, we've got demographics. And got the demographics well, I, meant, I understand that, but I meant to, to the different levels, the affordable, the different I'll break groups. It down for each level. Right, and I don't see that in here. And and I think that's important that we have a feeling if we're talking about younger people or older people or middle aged or, or uh, you know in the prime of their life, uh, where where are they where are they when they need the affordable housing in our county? And then the second thing is the same thing we were talking about in the, next, in the case before us here with the, uh, the roads and the sidewalks. And are these affordable houses going to have the, the sidewalks so these kids can get to school? I mean, I mean here but we are putting again, school in. Again, you got to look at it. You tell us. Just, I mean, what's the objective and what's the policy? This is what we've got here. We've got objectives and we've got policies and in different... Yeah, and in different elements. Right so now, all of our... The housing unit now, when you're talking about sidewalks, bicycle paths... And, and actually, that's that's the transportation element. And we'll, we'll... It all kind of fits together, right? Yes. Yeah, it is a comprehensive plan. And then in the water it. issue, too. I mean, we got uh, portable water issues here in the county. Right. And, and the utility advisory committee has been looking... How many... Have they looked at portable water? They look at the portable water two times so far, and again, they're going to look at it again in the next month or so. And I can, one of the reasons why we've been holding off on bringing the potable water to you is they, there seems to be kind of a change in philosophy. It looks like surface water reservoirs are not probably going to be our long-range solution. It's probably going to be the boulder zone of the Florida and Aquifer. Is that yes. correct? Yes. And 
That's you know, right now, the, 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 let me just tell you, when, believe it or not, we're not experts in all areas okay. as planners. And, and we have to rely on experts. Uh, we have to rely on traffic engineers. We have to rely on hydrologists and geologists for a lot of this. And that's, that's particularly the case with water. We, we need to rely on technical expert, experts for a lot of data. And we need to try to help them compile that into a workable plan. With, with, what, with what Richard said, though, I mean, he's about sidewalks, et cetera. And tonight was a perfect example of the probably the need. Yeah, we need the, to. The dilemma you have, and this is, I'm not sure, because we, the last time we did EARs was eight or nine years ago. I mean, it was. We, we did it in 96. We did when, yes. Boy, I've been here too long. Um, but the, the fact is, is that you, there's two, uh, <laughs> there's two elements. And one is it's everything is in addition to new development. And in, in the transportation element, sidewalks and all are very pretty well addressed. I mean, if you look at all, a lot yeah, of the new developments, we keep putting in sidewalks. And you drive around, I'm sure like I do, we see sidewalks go nowhere on either way. Yeah. The, the dilemma is how to tie in the, the older infrastructure, like 4th Street. I mean, how to fix it and where it, you don't have that problem. And that's, I'm not sure how you, how, how you, get how you well, there. The person I, that brought up the question about 66 coming down there, I think it was right. Donna. I mean, People are going to be going out 4th Street, even if it's a dirty old road, because 58th Street's not working, 43rd's not working, and it, you've got to go 8th Street, 4th Street, or 12th Street to get... They'll be going out, probably west, not west, as much west, coming yeah. back. And so, I think the traffic is, is an issue at some point. Huge. And, and I'd encourage you, we will be bringing you the traffic element. If, Just if, keep if, thinking C, C+. Plus. <laughs> I just want you all to think C. Dr. Baker, also... <laughs> we have the SHIP program that the applicant will apply and we have to service. approve them and so forth. And we see most of the extremely low and very low income, they are either in one parent household, that again there is a single mom with a couple of kids and so forth, or they are elderly folks that again the husband is dying or whatever, they have only on social security as income. Those are really the bottom, you know, extremely low and very low. When you go toward the moderate income, then you see some younger people that they are working and then they are moderate. Of course, moderate income is between 80 to 120 percent of the median income. But when you look at the below 50 percent of the median income, mainly some elderly and some, again, one the, parent. The high, actually, our high average income works to the advantage of the affordable income because it's a based on that average income is 12 divided the medium yeah. the medium income and they, because of the developers get credit and they, they have the rights to charge certain rents and so I think that yeah. in a lower income area average in their area you don't get as um, as much benefit they get a pretty good benefit we don't allow as we quit we well we allow it now but we we dropped off on affordable housing we stopped approving some Actually, I the formula dictates the uh, there's right. a for formula that's going to dictate the price of the housing. It's got to be competitive. The rent's competitive, and it's just the amount they pay percentage-wise. I think. So. Aren't our numbers skewed because of the income of three two nine six three zip code? Yes. And how how do we fix that problem? Well, well, well you, medians aren't medians aren't averages and means are. Yeah. You know, a, a median is the actual middle point of all it, the range. So that's really not that skewed. Into the, I thought it was, you know, yeah, right. A, that's a real number. So, so and, and our median is about 55. Not 57,000 is about median income. But overall, so that means, the median means half the people in the county, half the households make more than that, and half make less. And that's households, not per Correct. Owner. Households, exactly. yeah. Any, yeah, any yeah. real discussion or focusing on this element tonight, if you've read it, and the, the, the place probably to, uh, to look is to look at their additions, deletions, and work backwards if you've got things you want. Cause look, kind of look at how they, how they did, and then if you've got ideas to add to it. But, this is the housing element is in a, as all of them are important. This one's probably one of the easier ones. We'll get into the harder ones are the ones some of which you've touched on already, Richard. When you get into the and, and transportation and water, let me just 
Let me warn you, when we get to land use, we're going to go over yeah. by objective by objective, yeah, we're policy not, yeah. by policy. We won't blow and, through that in here. And how many, there are 20 objectives in land use? At least. 20 or 22. Yeah. So, so that's, that's going to be a lot of hard objective, work. Objective's got about six subsections. Yeah. I have one question, Mr. Uh, I noticed that one of your major recommendations, or your top recommendations for, for the affordable housing issue was the community land trust, yes. using that as a method. Now, I know that we've been looking at these and, and have discussed these with a number of organizations, and nobody has seemed to come up with a way to make it work. Have you come up with some ideas on how to make it work? There is the the Coalition for Attainable Homes is one of the soon-to-be 501c3s that we work with out there, and they're in the final stages of, of forming a community land trust. Oh, it, this, it's a real, it's a real challenge. neat process. It is a challenge, and we're 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 hoping it will work and be a model for the community. And it is really work when the housing price is very high, because with community land trust, community land trust own the land; they only sell the vertical. But again, in the market right now, we're seeing the brand new home, three two for hundred twenty three thousand. And when that's the price now for the brand new home, then the people, maybe they are not willing to go to a land trust because the land trust are not getting the full equity. There is lots of limitation. Therefore, that community land trust could really work when the price is really high, like in 2006 or 2005, it would make more sense than right now. But right now that we are declining market, maybe it's not going to work. The, the other thing to keep in mind on housing with affordable housing is you, you got them, you, they're trade offs. You either go vertical and multifamily or you go small lots and, and we, it's, it's like bringing in a school or you bring in something into an area where you, 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 uh, you think it's necessary and there's usually some objection to it. So if you Not believe in affordable mind. housing, you, uh, as our rep down on the other end will find out, if he doesn't already know, is you will probably grit your teeth and make it happen. So, okay, anything anything else, Sasan, before Sasan? Okay, good. Thank, Thank you, sir. We'll see you again soon. <laughs> um, any Commissioner Matters? I was wondering about uh, we, we, I, the county commission passed uh, an ordinance, I believe, for cutting uh, vegetation uh, up to a certain 12 inches or something like that. A nuisance abatement, yes. And uh, just driving down 510 on the north side of the urban service area there, there's a, quite a few cleared areas where I notice that peppers are beginning to get up about uh, 10, 12 feet. <laughs> now, uh, it's time for a roundup. Is there any... Uh, Actually, actually, that doesn't address peppers. The the nuisance ordinance does not address peppers. So we're just gonna let them go. Well, <laughs> uh, we yeah, well, if, if it's I on, would think I mean, why doesn't it address nuisance or exotic plants that are, are not? I mean, you you make people take them out. Right. right. How did we miss right. that? Well. If I could just, not all that property is actually in the unincorporated area, so there are some project areas in the city of Sebastian that were cleared. Uh, I'm not right. sure if that's the, the property you're looking at, but you're, you're correct. Uh, staff, well, the, the county regulations require those kinds to come out when development, land is cleared and development proceeds. So I'm not aware of any situations in newer projects in the unincorporated area where that's the case. So it might be a Sebastian problem. Possible. Yeah. Okay. I'm kind of looking toward Greg in case he had any other comment about any of that. Um, anything else? Uh, staff? Just a couple of things real quickly. Since your last meeting, the Board of County Commissioners approved two rezonings that you all recommended that they approve. One um, was from IG to CG west of where Crispers and Five Guys is, and the other is down at 27th Avenue. You okay? <laughs> Uh, down 27th Avenue in the county line, uh, St. Lucie County line, going from CN to CL. Um, also, as a bit of a follow-up to yesterday's workshop, I passed out to you all some of the, the, the slides. The two presentations, presentation by Dr. Bromwell and Dr. Bacchus, if they're not already on the county website, they will be tomorrow morning, so you can see the entire PowerPoint presentations. 
But I think some of you all were interested in a couple of the slides uh, listing of the, the regulations uh, that Dr. Bromwell had and his conclusions and recommendations and then Dr. Bacchus's. Uh, so you've got those in front of you now. We also were expected you to reply to Sydney's <laughs> list of permit changes pro or con because, I, in my opinion, there were several in there I thought we had addressed already. Yeah, I think and I think you need to answer yes. You you don't you get beat up all the time, but we'll give you the shot to answer now. <laughs> we don't care to defend ourselves every time, but um, <laughs> now we'll, we'll be in contact. And in, and in fact, Dr. Bacchus is going to going to give some more follow up to the questions that we've sent out. What I anticipate is either in the next packet or the following packet, we'll do a follow up for you all and, and include it in the information packet to yesterday's mining workshop. For the next workshop. Um, traffic and nuisance issues. Um, unless there's any objection from you all, we'll look at setting up a, a date, date in yeah. the in the second or third week in May. Are there any any times in the second and third? That's basically from about May 12th to the 23rd. When's the moratorium over? In in July, and it will need to be extended. Okay. Should we be recommending that now? Uh, we're already working with the attorney's office on getting that in front of the. We can only go 12 months. That's, right? that, yeah. You're correct. 12 months total. That's correct. So if if I, if I don't hear any dates, or if if you guys don't don't know, oh, give me a call, yeah. email oh, me, good. let me know. Thank you. I mean, after up. the after our last experience on dates and times, were there any complaints? Did, I mean, is Wednesday probably going to be the day then? So that we don't. I mean, and and is there any complaint? Would anybody like, rather do this at night than during the afternoon? Wednesday was good for me. I mean, I don't know what you all's better day during the week is. But we I mean, can make Wednesday afternoon work. We can we can try that again. It's okay with me. So, so, so we just, just email you with the days we can't make it. That would be great. So that would be I either May that. that'd be either May fourteenth or May twenty first. Twenty first. And so again, I won't. Twenty first is good. Okay. May fourteenth is good. If if you all have any uh, any problems, just email me or give me a call. Um, the only other thing that I wanted to mention is with the, the planning information package, I know that, that some of you all uh, from time to time uh, give us information to include, and, and, and we do that. Um, I actually got something from the chairman, uh, an innovative type of uh, residential clustering idea that I just wanted to show you all. I didn't have a chance to get it into the packet. <laughs> and uh, just wanted you all to, to see that, you know, we're told to think outside the box. So if, if you guys run across anything innovative, out at Blue Cypress. You can you remember that traffic si line I sent you? You need to put that right in front of it. <laughs> you know, so. that is good for Blue Cypress. That would really Tell you what, I'm, I'm, whoever did that was right creative, if you ask me. <laughs> I like the Puerto Pot myself. Yeah. My, uh, I felt right at home. <laughs> That's um, all you have. Anything else? George, any attorney's matters? Mr. Chairman, I'm sure you all are aware that the uh, county uh, Board of County Commissioners voted to uh, uh, enter into a settlement agreement with the St. John's River Water Management District uh, over the Sand Lakes Parcel. Sand Lakes will stay in mm -hmm. conservation now, and uh, additional 460 acres of privately owned land will go on, uh, will also become public conservation land. Um, and the final uh, aspect is the uh, county will be presenting uh, the interlocal service boundary agreement and where we are to date and uh, seek uh, direction from the Board of County Commissioners at the next meeting Tuesday. Thank you. I think where everybody, is, Richard, is everybody uncomfortably comfortable with the deal? Is that it? Uh, that's, yes. Yeah, okay. Where does the concrete uh, plant suit stand? Where are we with that? The, the um, ocean concrete yeah. uh, has uh, until May, sometime in early May, to refile their complaint. Um, the county's original argument for its in its motion to dismiss was that the uh, ocean concrete had failed to exhaust administrative right. remedies. They've uh, now exhausted administrative remedies, so they will okay, so that, okay, refile gotcha. and we will answer. Nothing else. We stand adjourned. Boy, that one's going to take a few days to work its way through.